Uh, if there's no other questions, I think we'll start with our discussion of chapter number seven, data import. And today what we're gonna do is we're gonna be talking about how to read data from a file. I do have to admit, if I go back to my days, starting with R, I think that was the hardest issue was just figuring out how do I actually get data into R so I can actually work with it and do the fun things that I want to do. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about read R, which is the tidyverse package to read in rectangular data sets. We're going to talk about different file formats. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about CSVs, comma separated values, which is the most common rectangular data type that's out there. We're gonna talk about header rows, column names. We're gonna talk about the importance of other rows. And then we're also gonna talk about um, what we mean by columns separated, delimited by commas. So <clears throat> although we're gonna talk about CSVs, not every file format that you could potentially import into R is gonna be a CSV file. And so uh, there is some certain tooling out there provided by ReadR and other packages that help you read in data. So. That's kind of the roadmap for today. What we should be, um, oh, that's what we will be getting out of it. Those are kind of learning objectives that we want to get to. And just like always, if people have comments uh, or questions, you know, you can drop them in the chat. I'll be monitoring it the best I can. Or also feel free to come off mute. And um, if you feel comfortable uh, opening your camera, more than happy to do that. Again, I want to hear other people's ideas of how they actually do this workflow of importing data. So that's the roadmap for today. Uh, so we're gonna talk about read CSV. This is gonna be probably the workhorse for pretty much reading in CSV files. Uh, I will admit that it. I would want people to get more comfortable, or this is a, a, a function and a package that you wanna get comfortable with because a lot of the data files that you probably work with are going to be CSV files. There are other file formats out there, but a good chunk of files in my uh, in my industry and in the time that I've worked, a lot of them are CSV files. And so that's what I work with. And so when we talk about read CSV, we have to talk about its different arguments that are available to it. And the first argument that we always have is the file path. And last week in the workflows discussion, you talked a little bit about file paths, file paths being the physical location of where your files are located on your computer. That's the first argument, telling read CSV, where's your data? Uh, I really appreciated how the book talks about the here package. Um, I use here all the time. Um, it's, a great, uh, it's a great utility function to help you keep your file paths and your working directory in place. And so if you wanted to, what you can do is you can use the here package to say, hey, pull this student CSV data into, or pull this file data, directory students.csv and import it and assign it the variable name students, right? And if you do that, ReadR will import the data and give you some information about what gets imported. Now, what's really nice about Read CSV is it gives you some information up front of what gets imported, right? It tells you that it imported six rows, five columns, and it provides additional information about what delimiter it used and it talks about the different data types that it was able to identify. Later on in our discussion today, we're going to highlight that or how actually read R actually or how read CSV does this, how it does the identification of data types on its import. And it's a really important concept to talk about here is, is that you want to be aware of your data types on import. Because what you expect may not, or what you expect to happen may not necessarily happen. And that's based on the data within your columns or the data types that you have. And we'll talk more about that subject here in a second. So the next thing that Readar does, and it's a nice convenience, is because we have the inner, the wonderful aspects of the internet, um, Readar can read a CSV file directly from a URL. And so I do apologize that I have to scroll here for you to see this. But if you have a CSV file at a specific URL endpoint, just like this r for ds student CSV file, you can point it there. Uh, I think this is a great convenience if you have the ability to store your CSV files um, via U a URL. Uh, if you're familiar with um, Tidy Tuesday, 
Uh, they do have a package to import this data or they do have a package to import that data into R, but they also have the CSV files that you could use a specific link to just pull those CSV files if you wanted to. So it's a really nice convenience. When you think about file paths, it doesn't necessarily need to be a path to your specific or a location on your computer. It could be a file path or a URL endpoint pointed somewhere else, which is really, really cool. So um, let's move on to talking about transforming data during read and then I'll open up for any comments or uh, questions that people might have. So when you are importing data, you wanna think about transformation, right? So when you're importing data, during that import step with read CSV, you can transform your data on that read. And some of the common things that you might have to transform when you're importing data is thinking about NA values, right? So you're missing values, data that isn't there. Um, I don't, I can't remember if we talked too much about NA values, but NA values are just any missing value within your data. How that is defined is going to be based on the data that you're working with, um, but it's just not there. And so that's the first consideration that you have is how are NAs represented within your data? Because there are countless ways that people represent that, and we're going to talk more about it. Um, NAs can wreak havoc on your analysis, and so you need to be aware of them. And so to deal with them right away, Read CSV gives you some arguments that you can do to uh, help that. The other thing that we're going to talk about is non-syntactic uh, column names or uh, non-syntactic meaning they don't follow the general conventions to be valid names within R, which we've talked about way in like chapter number one or number two, I think. Um, but there's some like steps that we can use in read CSV to take care of that. And what's also nice is if we know that we have a specific data type that we need to import, we can be very explicit in our read CSV call to say like, hey, I know this is a character vector. Hey, I know this is a factor. Hey, I know this is a double. There are some functions that we can use in our read CSV to actually just explicitly state that. So, so that's what we're gonna kind of dig into here a little bit more. But before I go into mislabeled NA values, uh, does anybody have any, or what questions do people have or comments that they wanna share um, when it comes to using read CSV? Um, uh, yes, me, Colin, thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, wondering, um, you said we can read from uh, URL, uh, URL mm -hmm. uh, files, but does it imply it should be like a, a link you can download the file? For example, I'm wondering, I, I work a lot with the Open Science Framework. Mm. The Open Science Framework, you can upload your CSVs and then you go, you can get an a URL when you display, like in the uh, OSF portal, the, the table. But that doesn't mean that this function could read it as well, like get the file. I, I'm not sure. I'm just curious about it. Mm. Does anyone have any experience with that? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. Um, my first thing that I would say is if you know you have access to the data, try it, <laughs> see if it works. Um, that's like the first thing, but I don't know. I, I don't really work with URLs very often, so I'm going to open it up to the group. Does anybody have any experience using URLs with Read CSV? Um, no, not, not a lot. Cool, I, so I would I've try used it, but but not a lot. Um, I think it is implied that it's hosted somewhere. Uh, so, but, but yeah, I don't know. I'm actually I have a little project that I want to see if just hosting it on GitHub and something free works, and not just a Google Sheet or something like that. Yeah, I, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no, perhaps I just give it a try and and bring with and bring the answer the the, the next session. Yeah, cool. Yeah, let, let us know. <laughs> I mean, like I just default to like give it a try, see if it works, double verify that it's the data that you expect it to be, and if it works, it works. You know, I mean, um, I don't yeah, think I, 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 I. Go ahead. 
I, I was just taking a look. I have never worked with OSF, but it says that you can make certain things private or public. And I assume to be able to access it with read R, you would have to make it public. Yeah. So that would definitely, when you're testing it, I would pay attention to make it public because then it's probably a link that can be reachable by anyone. Cool. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, thanks, Stefan. Um, really appreciate everybody's feedback on that. I will say where I come across this, I, I teach a class in this and we make our data sets available to students this way. And we do give them the CSV files and have them set up their projects. But like a lot of them, they figure out towards the end of the semester that they're like, oh, I can just use the URL that's pointed to the GitHub repository to it and just pull data that way. And so I know it works on GitHub, at least with publicly accessible GitHub files. So um, GitHub is a great option. Okay, cool. Um, let's see. Oh, so let's talk about mislabeled NA values. So um, on default, uh, read CSV, when it reads it, it's gonna look for an empty character string and that's what it's gonna use to replace NA value, or it's going to replace empty character strings with NAs in R. So that's its default. But again, the data that you have, there may be different ways that people who entered that data or inputted that data or the system inputted that data to represent NAs. So there's this little example data set, or while we're playing with the students.csv data set, NA is actually represented with N slash A. So if we have to, and we want to treat this as NA in R, so on the import, so once it's imported into R to treat it as NA, we have to use the NA argument here and specify, hey, this character string N slash A is gonna be missing value. And in addition to it, it's gonna be the missing character vector. You get to change this to whatever it is. If you know for a fact that there is no missing character vector or the missing character value or missing string values in there, you can just delete this. But What's nice about this is that you have the flexibility to define on your import what your NA values are. Um, so you just kind of have that flexibility to do that. So here you can look one on import of the student CSV data. On the import, we have um, this favorite food column. It's a character vector. Now we have the NA representation in the CSV file, it's N slash A, but as it gets imported, it's treated as an NA in R. And so we explicitly said, hey, the character string n slash a is na, import it, it's that. So um, I do have to say for people that are new to this, na values, again, they're really important to know. It's it's a really important thing to to keep in mind. Um, because I have been I have been burned before with NA values in my analysis. And it's just, it's one of those things that you don't think about, especially if you're on a deadline and you're trying to get things done on a fly. Um, NA values can can burn you. And so it's just good to know your data. What are your NA values? I know that's not the fun stuff, but it's it's really important. Uh, so the other thing that is out there is non-syntactic column names. And we've talked about what non-syntactic is, but we do have to talk about a convention to fix these when we do import. So in the student data sets, there is a student ID um, name that's non-syntactic and a full name. And I don't know why the slides formatted it this way as an equation, but we'll just go with it. Um, once you import it in, what you can do is there's this function from, I think it's tidyr, I, or is it readr or tiny or tidyr? I, got, I think this is tidyr. I think rename, rename comes from tidyr. I think it's um, dplyr. dplyr, yep, thank you. I appreciate that, Stefan. Um, so basically you've already imported your data, but if you want to rename it, you have to use these back ticks and back ticks aren't usually used. It's your tilde key or the key right above your um, shift, not your shift, but your um, tab key. And because student name and full name has a space to actually reference these in R, you have to use back ticks. Um, and then rename, all you have to do is just the new name equals whatever your non-syntactic name is. And then further on in your data analysis or further on your pipeline, you'll just refer to your column as student ID, full name in this. Um, one thing that's really nice that I do is if you don't know what non-syntactic names you have in your, your tibble when you import it that you have in your data or in your um, R session, 
is just do a glimpse on students. And what it will do is, or your data frame that you want, it will give you the tildes for non-syntactic names. So use your old friend copy paste. And so um, you can just go do like a glimpse, identify those non-syntactic names, copy it, paste it in your rename and move on with your life. Um, so that's just a neat little trick that I found out that glimpse will print out the non-syntactic names with the back ticks if you need to identify them quickly. So there you go. We just fixed those non-syntactic names. Uh, if you just want, and we've kind of talked about the janitor package already, but this is, if you ask me to name like the top five packages that I use, uh, janitor is up there in that top five. Janitor gives you a lot of convenience functions to help you clean non-syntactic column names. And it's not part of the tidyverse, but it is very handy for like cleaning up your data. And it gives you a lot of different things or a lot of different utility functions to um, clean up uh, your, your column names. And basically all it does here is it takes all of the non syntactic names and it applies them into snake case. I'd have to look um, because I default to snake case, so I don't look at it, but I know for a fact that the arguments and clean names do provide you the option to do whatever formatting or naming you want to do or naming convention you want to follow. So if you want to do camel case, if you want to, I think you can do even do skewer, just look over the clean names documentation and it will show you what to do. Um, but instead of just doing the manual rename, just put janitor clean names, check and make sure it looks like what you want it to be. And it does a really good job of actually cleaning up your names. So. Um, before I move on to mislabeled variable types, does anybody have any, or what, what questions do people have about what we've discussed or just any other general comments that people might have? Are there any, so you work a lot with CSVs, uh, but I, I guess I, I haven't looked at the slides or whatever, but I know there's also importing from Excel files. Um, I think it's the read Excel package, but I don't know if you have any, you know, in terms of the differences, in terms of what to keep in mind, uh, or yeah, what's your experience with that? Yeah, so um, I'll open that up to the group. I have my opinion <laughs> on some of those things, but I'm going to first open it up to the group, so I'm not dominating the conversation. But does anybody have any experience with that? Uh, yeah, I, I've used uh, yeah, a lot of times in the past. I think the one thing I remember is you have to close the file to uh, access it. I, I don't know if that's uh, that's the same for everybody. So if you have the file open, I guess you can't run the command, uh, like import it, I think. Yeah, and uh, so I, these are opinions um, that I have uh, about this is any, for me in the space that I work in, if you can get it into a CSV file, do it. Um, because I've had the experience with Excel files that people can put information in there that doesn't get translated into the import, right? And so one of those examples would be using color, right? So like some people, they like to put color mm -hmm. in certain cells that doesn't get imported. And so if you can like, if you can get it into a CSV and get that information into the CSV file, do it. Um, but if you are working in a space, I've used read Excel before, um, that works pretty well. Um, and it also comes down to the question of what that Excel file is, if it, fi if it follows tidy data principles, um, because I have dealt with data files that don't have that as well. And it's really hard to get that wrangling for what you need it to be. But yeah, that's my experience and my opinions is if you can get it into a CSV format, do it, but it's dependent on the space you work in. But I want to open that up to the group if anybody else has any more to add. anybody else work with Excel files or is everybody lucky enough to just work with CSVs? Try not to. Mostly CSVs. 
as I always ask uh, my collaborators and people, uh, people I work with to work with CSB files, like that's a, a standard for me. Yeah, it's, I, I know I'm probably maybe going on a tangent here, but I, I saw this graphic the other day, it was, I was watching this research thing and somebody had this like pyramid and like the top, it had like a dollar amount with every pyramid and it was like a dollar at the top, $10 in the middle of the period, $100. And they were just trying to make a point of like, at the top of the pyramid, if you can like figure out how you structure your data at the start of your project, which would be, hey, get in the CSVs, that costs you a dollar. But if you go down later in your project and you're trying to do like some more of the more bigger stuff, that's going to cost you more in terms of time and effort to try and actually do it. So I don't know. I don't know if that adds much to the conversation, but I came across that the other day and I was like, oh, this kind of applies. Use CSVs if you can. So, But I should be careful with that. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Stefan. Sorry. I think one of the advantages is that it uh, takes away the temptation to do anything in an Excel file. So my experience has been working with other people that they then start creating variables in the Excel file instead of doing everything in R. And then suddenly you have, again, reproducibility issues. And I think with CSV, the main advantage is you cannot do it. Like it's just written and that's it. And so that's one of the things I like about uh, switching to CSV, uh, but it can be a, quite a blocker with other people. Um, yeah. Yeah, excellent point. And, and calculated fields. <laughs> um, I think somebody came off of mute there. Um, so let's, um, let's see, uh, what else do we have? Okay, so yeah. And the other thing that I got to remember too is um, there's other file types too. And as we get into the realm of large data, big data, if you're um, working in the, that area, there's other file formats. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So parquet files, um, some other binary file types, that's another place that gets discussed. So I keep harping on going on CSV, but depending on your use case, you might be using a binary file type um, for dealing with like large and big data workloads. So, okay, let's talk about mislabeled variable types. So, um, let's see. Okay. So, yep. So there's this column meal plan in our example data set. It is, ca it's categorical, but it could be considered a factor. And we haven't talked much about factors yet, but factors is a data type in R and factors are basically like, um, factors are basically like values that are, are they're string values, but they only take certain categories or they only have certain categories associated with them. So, um, so when we talk about this thing about meal plan, if we kind of look at it, there are these certain categories like lunch only, breakfast and lunch. I'm sure there's probably like supper or dinner in here or something we know that that column can only take certain values and that's where factors shine. And so what we can do is, is that on our, after our import, we can mutate it into a factor. And so what we can do is we can just do factor around it and then it will actually set those values based on what's in here. You also have some flexibility that doesn't get talked too much about in here um, is that you can actually be explicit on what your factor levels are. Um, so that's available. So Ar Arjun asked a question about what are the benefits on converting a character vector to a factor? Um, I am going to open that up to the group because I don't, I use factors. Uh, I think it's, it's nice because it constrains the specific values that you can have within that column or that variable. And I think there's also a, um, an efficiency gain too and how it gets processed, but that's kind of getting into the weeds of it. But I don't know, I'll open that up to the group for people who work with, yep, sorting works um, like enum. So sorting is, is a lot faster and more efficient. Um, but yeah, does anybody else have any like other benefits of converting your columns to factors? Yeah, yeah, I was um, just saying, oh yeah, sorry. For my comment there, yeah, I think sorting, it's it's better for sorting generally. And 
works like an enum is just saying the same thing that you said, Colin, and that you have set set values there that make make the data look nice and clean and and that sort of thing. And it works well inside ggplot for reordering legends and all these kind of things. So generally, if you have a set of characters and there's a limited set of values, it's a good idea to throw it as a back factor because it's better for later plotting, visualization, and analysis, I think, often. What's that yeah. enum? Sorry, I didn't get that. <laughs> oh, it just, uh, sorry, that's a, a, a term for my, my dev world where it just means you... It's a it's a set of it's a set of fixed values. You enumerate a set of fixed values, essentially. Yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, excellent. I think somebody else was going to add something else. Did anybody else have any anything else they want to say about factors? Yeah, I can Do say. Mostly they covered are... it. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, but I, I was going to add, like, in terms of uh, analysis, I found that. I don't know, sometimes you're running a linear model or something and or mixed model and you want certain categories, you know, or uh, a fit term is a, it asks for a factor, not characters. So um, it really helps having it that way because then it knows, right, it's an enumerated category and how it's going to test for that versus characters it starts throwing errors or some base functions uh, kind of don't handle it well yeah absolutely and, and i think somebody else is going to add something else uh, please please add what you have uh, no it's definitely the same thing uh, bolivar just said if they are not factors the regression will not run no. yeah so certain analyses probably require it um, where I use factor values is survey data. So I deal with survey data sometimes. And so you have certain levels for surveys, you know, like if you're using like a Likert scale or something, you just know for a fact, like there's no values outside of it. And if there are, it will flag it a lot easier for you. And so you can have another kind of like validation check on it. So excellent. Uh, great conversation around that. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. So mislabel variable types. So, um, in our example data set that we're working with, we have this age. Um, age is generally a int or an integer type. Um, but on our import, it gets treated as a character, character being string. Um, and that's because there's a five. So somebody, maybe data entry or something, they typed in the number F-I-V-E or the word, not number, no, the word five instead of the actual integer five. And so that's a data entry issue that we have to confront. And so how do we fix that? Well, we can use this function mutate uh, from dplyr. Um, all we do is we just extend it. And I don't really use parse number and I probably should, um, but what you can do is you can use parse number and you just throw this other function if else. And basically what you say is you take the column name, you do uh, an equality where it says like, if it is the number five, change it to number five, and then um, I'll put it in the same variable, age, and then it just assigns it to age. And so it just fix that, it fixes that issue of that data entry issue, right? Um, I did wanna highlight like, why is this important? Because it kind of goes back to like, kind of the ethos of like, why we go and write all this code on import, right? Some people might say, well, just go back to the CSV file and change it. Well, it comes back to that issue of like, reproducibility and data integrity. Like when you bring your data in, you don't wanna be doing hand manipulation of your data or that's not as reproducible. And so it's better to have it documented in code or it's more reproducible if you document what you're actually changing because you're keeping that source data as pure as it was once it was collected. Because that five might represent something that's important to the person who is entering that data. And so, um, and the other thing is just like, if you had a bunch of this, you don't want to be spending your, your Friday, Saturday going through and changing all of those. So it's just a really nice convenience to just use mutate parse number and it will convert it to the correct data type. We'll fix your issues and then convert it to, I think it changes it to int, but let me, let me just check. No, nope, changes to double. Um, so parse number makes sense. So it just goes to double, but I'm sure there's probably like a parse integer or something. So, um, Let's see. Yes, R assigns each element numeric. Yep, yep. 
Oh, that's the efficiency gain too. Um, Dewey brought brought this up about factors, and I don't want to go back on this, but how it doesn't in the background is it attaches a numeric value and then it attaches the labels to the numeric value, and that's how it does it. That's how it's efficient for factors. But getting in the weeds a little bit. So there's other arguments that are available from Read CSV. Um, there is an exercise in here that asks you to explore the arguments of Read CSV. I highly suggest you do that. If we have time, I'm gonna bring over my R Studio and show you a couple that I thought were kind of interesting. That's always a good thing. Like if you come across a new function is just just look at the, what are all the function arguments? What, what are available to you? But the ones that the book highlights are this one about comment, skip, and column names, which we'll talk about each here in a second. And we're gonna use this, um, we're gonna use this example uh, data set, which I thought was kind of interesting, and I didn't know this about read CSV, but you can actually pass. It makes sense, um, but I didn't think about it actually writing it in code, that read CSV will actually just read a string, which I thought was kind of cool. This is great for if you needed to create a reprex really, really quick. Um, this would probably be a really quick way to do it. You can use Tribble too, um, but if you want to just do like a really simple data set, this is a really quick way to do it really, really quick. So that was kind of a neat like point. So skip, uh, skip basically just tells R to skip the end number of lines starting at the header row. Um, and so a good example of this, say we have the CSV file that has this first line of metadata, the second line of metadata, and then you actually get your, met your actual data. If you do skip two, what it will do is it actually skips these first two lines and then it reads your, your actual data. Um, this is, I found to be really useful. And in fact, I have used this in a process that we have. We have a system that outputs a CSV file to us and it has like 15 or 16 lines of metadata before you actually get the actual like data itself. And so all I have to do is like skip equals 15, skips all the lines I uh, need to skip and then it imports the data, has the header row correct and everything else. So really neat little trick to like skip a few of the lines if you want to keep that data integrity coming out of the source system and then being able to import it really, really quickly. So uh, this is a good time before we talk about comment, but does anybody have any questions about um, mislabeled variable types, other arguments, or the skip argument within read CSV? All right, cool. Skip, skip is pretty intuitive, so. Um, another one is comment. So if you want to drop all lines that start with a like a, a pound sign, because uh, pound is a representation of a comment in certain text files. And so if you want to skip that, you can use comment. I've never come across a file that has this, but I'm probably sure that there's somewhere out there that somebody has. If you do have that issue, comment's a, a great way to do this. The other thing I think is if you pass another value in here, it would probably use that as comment. So, I mean, this is kind of going away from CSV, but like SQL files, like the dash dash would be a comment. And so, you know, if you have dash dash comments, you could skip it. So, uh, I think that makes pretty intuitive sense. So I don't need to stop there. All right, column names. Um, column names is an argument that it defaults to false. And it will automatically assign column names using this convention of X1 to XN. So if you have 15 column names on your import, it will go X1, X2, X3, all the way to X15. So this is, this is nice, right? Like if you have an issue with your header row and you need to fix your column names. But the real power of this comes from actually having a character vector to rename your stuff. So with column names, instead of passing false, you can actually pass a character vector with the names of your columns. And I go back to this example that I was talking about with the skip n, that example of the source system where I have like 15 rows that I need to skip. Because I have to skip 15 rows, there's no like header row that gets included. And so what we have is on the import, 
we just actually put the actual names explicitly in here. Um, you do want to make sure that your data does not change because this is just going to do it positionally. But if you know that your data is not going to change from the source system, you can just explicitly state your column names in the column names argument. I've found this to be super, super useful uh, for some of the stuff that we do. But um, yeah, so before we start talking about other file types, does anybody have any other tricks or um, tips for using like column names, comments, or skip? I guess another put, do people use these in their day-to-day -day work? Well, I used I used it in a homework assignment where they specifically gave us a CSV that didn't have column headers. <laughs> if that counts, <laughs> hey, that counts. I mean, <laughs> I, you, you got to get those points on those assignments. So, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> From professional experience, using my example, it does happen. Like, it does happen. They are very convenient. Um, so you know, it, they, it does come up and you will use them um, from time to time. So just know that they're there. So uh, I spent literally like 42 minutes talking about like the importance of CSV files, but um, realistically in the world that we live in, there are tons of file types that you might come across. And in fact, I need to consider that I'm being very US centric in my view of file types because in other parts of the world, they use other file types like tab separated um, and so on and so forth. So um, I do apologize with my US centric view of using CSVs because in other parts of the world, they use other types of file types. But um, read R um, has a lot of different functions that allow you to read in different file types. So if, you're no, if you know you're working with a semicolon delimited file, read CSV too. We'll use this as the delimiter. Now, I guess we really didn't talk about delimiter, but what I highly suggest you do is, is if you have a CSV file, open it up outside of a program, not in Excel. Like open it up in a notebook, open it up in R. And what you can do is you can actually see what are the delimiters that are being used. Being used. The delimiters are just what, what the programs are using to actually create the rows and columns. And we talked about CSVs, commas are, are generally used, but, um, you know, it could use a semicolon. Uh, this is especially important because not every country uses a decimal marker for decimals. Um, some places use a comma and people can correct me if I'm wrong. I think European countries generally use the comma for decimals. I say that with some trepidation. So someone please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. It's definitely cool. true for Germany too. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I'm 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 keeping our, our friends, our global friends in uh in consideration here. Read CSV2 is available for you if you need it. Um you have tab separated. Um I have worked with tab separated files before. If you have it, read TSV. If you have a very um if you have a file that you have a delimiter that you have to be explicit about and it's not represented with a CSV or TSV, use read the lim. You can actually set the actual specific delimiter that you use. I don't work with fixed width files, and this was something that I was introduced while reading the chapter. Um, I'm curious to hear if anybody works with read FWF or where this gets applied, but this is an option. But I wanted to open up the group. Does anybody work with fixed width files? Yeah, I mean, I've certainly come across fixed width files in some of the analysis I've done, um, not in the context of R or anything, but um, certainly on the, the medical side, when we do some uh, claims processing, that data is all fixed width and I have to, it's a pain in the, pain in the <laughs> neck to, <laughs> to deal with, but uh, it is what it is. Yeah. So it's like, it's fixed width, like saying, like the columns are like, fixed to a certain number or what I that's yeah, what that's I don't a, understand yeah it's basically it, it ends up being uh each column has a very specific uh number of characters wide and they're so they're padded 
So basically, if you have a three character value in, in a column that is 13 characters wide, it gets padded with nine spaces or so. So it's a it's a pain. That's really interesting. I don't I mean, we probably could spend 15 minutes talking about that. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably a system thing. Like they're doing that for like a system purpose or I don't know, but uh, I don't know. What do you, I don't know. Do you, can you, can you answer that quickly? Or maybe that's like a sidebar conversation. Yeah. I mean, again, in my experience, it's, it's from this one particular standard that's still in, in heavy use in the healthcare industry for exchanging data. Um, and I think it it's there and it's that way because it's a really old standard to be frank yeah. that it should be replaced with something more modern. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, if anybody needs to work with fix with uh, radar has functionality to do that. Um, so in addition to this, there is read table and then there's read log. I don't work with Apache style log files, but if you do read log uh, is available to you. So. Let's talk a little bit about controlling column types. So controlling column types, uh, Radar will try and guess your column types based on the data that's there. Now I say that, but you need to be, you need to be aware of how it actually does that. So Radar is only gonna look at the first 10,000 rows and just makes a guess based on those values. So be aware that if you are working with data greater than 10,000 rows, you may wanna be aware about what's going on further down or be explicit right on data import because it's only gonna use 10,000. I don't know why it says 10,002. Maybe it is 10,002. Uh, maybe somebody should check into that. I think it's 10,000. No, wait a minute. Is that right? Cause I'm looking at the guess max for read CSV and it says a thousand. I think this is a typo on the notes. Yeah, maybe my two. understanding. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, my understanding, and maybe this isn't correct, is that it doesn't it doesn't do the first thousand. If you have a if you have a something with hundred thousand rows, it will sample a thousand across those rows. It doesn't just pick the first thousand. Yeah, absolutely. True? I think that's true. I'm double checking that maximum because number. It of tries to. Or... It tries to. Hit, hit on that sort of whole sample variability by kind of spreading spreading out their sample. Yeah, it, point, it points me to a vignette called column types. Um, yeah, so I do apologize if I misspoke and I think I probably need to dig in more, more into this. So I do apologize for misspeaking. So it might be based on a sample. If somebody can dig into that more, that would be great. I think Dewey, I think you're right, but- um, That's what yeah, we were talking about last, but I, <laughs> again- <laughs> Some of this is not real world experience. <laughs> so. I, I guess the, the main the two, two takeaways from this is like, just know that it uses a limited number of values to make a guess and you can be explicit on the import or you can extend this value too. So like if you want to increase the number of values that it uses to guess what type it is, you can, you can um, change that. How it does that, uh, I think I need to do a little bit more digging and if somebody wants to fill in, please do. Yeah, well, so like an example, I can tell you like a real specific example. They gave us a data set that had literally 30,000 rows and all, and they were and in one column they were all double except for four <laughs> that were character, right? And so so they were explicitly saying, you know, it's going to get this wrong because it's going to sample it, say it's a double, and then it's going to puke on those four that aren't double. Right. And so there's a few different ways you can you can deal with that situation. One of them is to say, sample the 67,000. And then it would say, oh, there's four in here that I can't convert. So it all has to go to character or, it, you know, it'll know that and and change the way it imports or you could handle them explicitly in a different way. So there's there's a few different ways to do it. But um... yeah, I think that's a great point. And I. I will be the first to admit I've gotten burned by this before. Um, I mean, some of the data sets that I work with get into the millions of rows and there's no way I'm going to validate a million rows. And so, you know, uh, I definitely have been burned by this before. So just be aware of it. And there's tooling to help you not get burned by it. 
Um, and Dewey brought up a good point here about how it actually goes through and makes that decision. And I'm not going to walk through these rules, but I highly suggest you read through them. But if it goes through those rules and can't determine these, then it's just going to default to a string, right? And so like if you read in your data and you see character, but it's a number, you know there's, are you, it's supposed to be a number, you know there's an issue and you need to fix it. So, but I do highly suggest reading these rules because that's that's the rules that read CSV will follow. Um, and I guess this heuristic works well if you have a clean data set, but not in real life. And so it kind of talks about the issue of like, maybe you need to be explicit. So here's that discussion about um, unexpected values. So it uses this example right here where maybe on data entry, instead of somebody putting an NA or leaving an empty value or an empty cell, they put a period. Um, don't know why this is the case that somebody did it, but it just happened. Um, if you read this in, you're gonna notice that our X variable gets turned into character. And, but we know if we knew our data that these are actually numbers and they probably should be a double or of, of type int. And so if we see this and we look at our data and we do like a glimpse on it, or we look at the column specification that gets outputted by read CSV, this is a good indication that we need to fix it or we need to address it. Let's see. Um, so you can be explicit. So we've been mentioning about how do you actually be explicit about setting your column types on import? There is this argument called call types. And what you do is you pass a list or a named list of your variable names. And read R has a bunch of these like column double, column integer. I have to look up all the references and I actually have the reference over here. But these functions actually are explicit saying, hey, my column types for X would be column double. Now the book highlights that if you try and do this explicitly and there's an issue, it will push a warning. And so with the warning, it also gives you this function of like problems, which you can look at to get a tibble of what the problems are. Now this is really important because we talked about that um, warnings are not necessarily bad things that have happened. Um, errors are clear things that are wrong. Warnings are things that you should double check. So I have found out that with importing data with read CSV, it is going to import your data. It is going to do it. It's, it's generally going to import your data. And if you see this warning, you probably need to check it because there could be an issue with it. And so this is how you check the issues. This is how you get the issues and figure it out. So, uh, and this is problems. This is more about problems, talking about what this is doing, how to fix that problem with the dot. We talked about NA. I don't think I need to spend any more time about how to fix this issue, but it just converts it to an NA. So, um, and Dewey sharing some, and there are functions you can call to better understand. Yep, and that's a great idea. Yep, those are great. Thanks for sharing those. So um, there's some good uh, stuff that, Dewey shared here about some functions to better understand how those importing rules in R work. And so, uh, let's see, cause we are definitely not gonna get done cause we're at the five minute mark. Um, here are the different column types. I don't think I'm gonna dig into each one of these, but these are available for you to explicitly state them. Um, you can read more about this uh, later on, but this is how you can explicitly set them. You can read more about them and how they actually work. I did want to get to oh, column types. Uh, yeah, some more overriding the default column types. Um, but I think the last thing I want to discuss, you can read more about overriding the default column types and so on and so forth um, using those call characters and stuff. Um, but I did want to get to this really, really cool thing the reading multiple files, because this is a common use case that I come across a lot in the work that I do, because some of the systems that we have and we work with output like weekly data, monthly data, so on and so forth. Read CSV has this uh, convenience built in that you can just point a character vector of file types or of file directories or file locations, file strings, and it will just read them in and stack them. And so all you have to do with this, as long as they're stored in the same directory, so that's the most important point is they have to be stored in the same directory. 
So a good example of this would be like if you have like the sales data one, sales data two, and they're both in this directory data, if you have a character vector with those file directory paths, you can just pass it right into read CSV and it will read it. But what's also nice is you can give an ID to the file type and what it will do is it will put here on the first part in your first column, it will give you the file pass of what got imported and then all of your data stacked into one tibble. So for people that have been probably working with R for a while, my workflow used to be using per, like per or uh, map DF. I have a lot of code that does that. But now I don't need to do that because read CSV, as long as that all the files are in the same directory, you can do this. Um, the other convenient about convenient thing, the last thing I'll talk about is there's this function called list files that allows you to set a specific pattern. So this is just a little regex to point out sales file that end in .csv. We're going to talk about regex later on, way in like chapter like 20 or something. But what we can do is we're just looking for files that kind of follow this specific pattern. We take all of the full names and then what we do is we get that list of character, we get that, we get a character vector of all of those file paths, put it in here, and now we have that, and we can just put that in, into read CSV and it will read all the files. I it this is it's magic to me. It's just amazing that that actually works. I have used this quite a bit. Um, so it's a nice little convenience if you're working with multiple files within a directory. So all right. That's the last thing I, I'm going to cover today. I think we can cover the rest, like writing to a file and then some of the like binary file types um, next week because workflow getting help is a short chapter. So I'll take about like five, 10 minutes to kind of finish up this chapter. But with the time that we have left, um, what questions or comments do people have? Um, I can hang out for a couple minutes after if people want to talk more about this stuff. Um, but just to be fair with people's time, um, we'll come almost the hour. So, yeah, no problem, Bolivar. Any other questions that people might have? Has anybody used this trick before with like the reading multiple files? Yeah, yeah, I think like you said, it was magic when I first used it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's just magic to me. I mean, I've I've been like a per map person for forever and I thought that was magic, but now that they've built this functionality into read R, it's even more magic to me. So it's it's awesome. All right, cool. Well, um, that's all I'm gonna cover today. Uh we'll finish up the rest of this chapter next week and then we'll go into um workflow getting help. I'll hang out here for a little bit if people want to talk a little bit more. But other than that, that's that's all I got for everybody. And so everybody have a good rest of your week and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a good week. Thank you. Thank you.